minute or two more for a few more people to come in. And then we'll get started. Welcome. You might want to put yourself on mute as you arrive. <laughs> Welcome. We'll get started shortly. Great, well, thank you for attending today's Nonprofit Academic Centers Council webinar on faculty recruitment, management, and evaluation in nonprofit academic programs. We have these series of webinars, and for those of you that are not familiar, our membership organization is, as you can see the mission on the screen, we have nonprofit academic centers or programs at accredited colleges and universities. And so if you're interested in learning about membership, uh, please uh, reach out to Nicole Collier or myself. Today's presenters of the amazing webinar that we have, we have two distinguished faculty members and administrators. Um, we have Dr. Patrick Rooney is Professor of Economics and Philanthropic Studies. He's also Glenn Family Chair in Philanthropy and the Executive Associate Dean for Academic Programs at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. He, is, along with several other colleagues, are instrumental in creating the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, the world's first school in philanthropy. And he's also the past president of the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council. And uh, Dr. Will Brown, he is a professor at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. He also holds the Mary, Julia, and George Jordan Professorship. He also was instrumental in helping establish and currently directs the Center for Nonprofits and Philanthropy at the Bush School of Government. Uh, he is also our president-elect of Nonprofit Academic Centers Council. So uh, I do want to say that this webinar is being recorded and uh, will be available for viewing afterwards. Also, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and the pre presenters will answer them towards the end of the meeting. So Dr. Rooney, you're on mute. He will be putting forth our presentation shortly. All right, sorry about that. My screen, I lost control of my screen for a minute. Everybody see that okay? All right, so uh, thanks Heather for the introductions and um, so Will and I are gonna tag team a little bit. And uh, I think, so the agenda is really the questions that uh, Heather promulgated as kind of the, the, the uh, agenda for the, for the uh, program. So I'm just gonna have a couple words to say about each of these things. So, um, so the first one, unique challenges and opportunities of recruiting and retaining philanthropy and nonprofit faculty members. I think one of the challenges is um, it's a relatively small but growing labor market. So when you think about who to recruit, you know, while for the new PhDs, it seems kind of overwhelming. Oops, screen's running away from me. Um, it, you know, it seems like it's overwhelming to find a job, but, uh, but it is a growing labor market. And, and it's also, there's a growing number of programs. And so the market is growing, uh, but, you know, it's not like in economics where there's, you know, for any given job you advertise, there might be a thousand applicants. Um, uh, whereas in philanthropy and nonprofits, uh, you know, there's going to be, you know, 10 or 20 or at most 50 people who are qualified to apply for a job. And so it's a very different uh, labor market in that regard. I think that there's, um, the, the labor market I would characterize as kind of hourglass shaped, that there's a lot of people junior faculty entering the labor market. 
And there's also a lot of people who are like me, who've been in the field for a long time and are exiting or will be exiting uh, in the not too distant future. But there's not that many people who are uh, kind of in that associate professor market who have been you know, tenured for a few years and looking to, you know, might be willing to relocate and uh, take a more senior position somewhere else. So relatively few in the middle. Most of the programs, as you, as you know, have one or two or three faculty members, a lot of onesies and twosies who tend to stay in one place for their careers. Um, another characteristic we see is that there's large pay differences across programs. That's affected by the size of the host university, the size of the host school or college, the size of the program and the income and wealth or endowments of the program and the perceived internal and external status of the program. So, um, you know, smaller schools, uh, you know, generally have lower salaries. Um, state schools, uh, you know, varies quite a bit. And, <laughs> you know, kind of elite universities tend to have higher salaries no matter what. And so that's affected by that. But if you're, you know, highly ranked or highly uh, have high perceived value, uh, the salaries tend to be higher. Another issue I think we have to think about a challenge is this enrollment cliff that's forecasted. And so how do you manage tenure track appointments as we, as we approach the, the uh, enrollment cliff? And I'll just talk about a couple opportunities then uh, I'm gonna let Will comment on this as well. So we see you know, growth in the, in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector, which leads to you know, more paid employment, which leads to more demand uh, for our courses, which leads to more demand for faculty. Um, and the retirement of boomers creates, sorry, this keeps running away from me. Um, the retirement of boomers creates leadership opportunities. Um, this creates demand for graduate degrees and certificates. And the retirement of boomer faculty members creates uh, new opportunities for new hires. Um, we've had three faculty retire in the last few years and expect at least a few more in the next few years. And then if you have endowed chairs, it makes it easier to insist that they're replaced uh, rather than zeroed out when people retire. Uh, subsequent generations are more aware of the desire to help and see working in the charitable sector as a way of, uh, of helping and they see their life, you know, not just stumbling into the philanthropic or charitable sector, they see their life course as working in philanthropy and nonprofits. And so I think there'll be growing demand for our programs generally. We just hired a new assistant professor who's going to teach um, philanthropy and environmental um, resilience. And I think climate change and climate awareness is also growing as well as uh, uh, social justice as we've seen uh, this last year. One more slide on opportunities and then I'll uh, turn it to Will. I, I think if you wanna attract and retain good faculty members, you have to pay good salaries and benefits have to provide research and travel funds and recognize that other centers and schools may try to recruit your faculty. So the best opportunity to make your place is to make your place a great place to be and so that they wanna stay. You can do that through having a great culture, you know, making it a nice place to be, providing money and opportunities and balancing workload between teaching, research and service. Indianapolis, for example, doesn't have mountains or oceans. So sometimes there's gonna be things that are tough for us to compete with. Uh, with other places um, and other factors, you know, sometimes are beyond your control as an administrator or as a peer faculty members. School for kids, job market for partners, housing market, et cetera. So, you know, one thing I would say at the end of the day is, you know, if someone gets recruited away, you just can't take it personally because it's just how it goes sometimes. If someone comes in and offers them a great job and more money and, and less work or a better combination of work and money. Um, and that and you can't match that, then you know, it makes sense for that person to leave. So Will, do you want to add any of that? Um, not not a lot. I mean, as you covered a lot of good points in regards to sort of opportunities. And I mean, I've I've seen more and more folks from tangential fields. So you're about the labor market, right? So the sociologists are showing up in more in presence than, than we've seen before in a couple of different ways. Um, 
but we still run into the challenge of definitions, right? We're a lot better off than we used to be. Um, you know, sort of adding adding philanthropy it helps, right? Instead of just relying on, on on philanthropy or a nonprofit as our nomenclature. But anyhow, I still find that the, the that that tends to be a, ch a challenge for folks to appreciate where we're at as part of what I'll talk about a little bit in the retention and how I sort of think about trying to get people to see it as an interesting area of study. Um, no, I mean, I don't know if people got any comments about, I mean, it's been a little while since we've had made our last hire, but it's been pretty consistent since I've been here 15 years um, that we've had people going in and out coming and going, you know, Patrick over to your shop or, or from your, you know, we've, we've, we've looked to your place in some ways too. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, it is an, it, but it feels like it's, 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 it's more robust now, but I agree with the, the odd shape of stuff too. I never know whether I'm in the middle or whether I'm at the end of the, 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 the cycle here, but there does seem to be a gap of, uh, associate professors who are looking to make that move. Perhaps that's always been a bit of a challenge for folks. I saw a question come through. Somebody was asking you about your the enrollment cliff, uh, Patrick. What were you thinking about that? So there's a forecast, a uh, demographic forecast, because the millennials are not having as many children. And, um, and so that I forget what year it is, but that uh, enrollments in colleges are going to drop across the board. And of course, you know, for the Ivy League schools where you have hundreds of applicants per admit, that won't create a problem. And for the University of Michigan's and the UC Berkeley's, um, where they have kind of similar ratios, again, not a problem, but I think for some of the state schools and less selective schools, uh, and, and private schools that are very enrollment driven, uh, it may become a, a cash flow budget issue uh, as well with the forecasting. All right, well, let's switch to um, enhancing faculty productivity just briefly. And, and I think that, you know, this is difficult because I, I think the, the way, you know, faculty are and their productivity are very autonomous in many ways, but I think you can recognize their strengths and weaknesses and the interests of your faculty members in a, on a personal level and play to their strengths and minimize the weaknesses. And, Mac, you know, and you have to really do that by, um, you know, everyone's got to teach, but, you know, help them out in their instruction and help them find better fits and um, provide mentors to help them with their teaching and their research. And, and maximize you know the connections of their work and their interests. So, um, you know we have a very iterative process in developing our schedule, and we encourage our faculty to experiment with new course ideas and so on. But if they don't go, you know because of the student enrollment, then you know we you know then they owe us a class, right? So we have to uh, balance that the number of preps and uh, but the student interests as well. I think another thing is you can use your contacts to help your faculty as a group, but also as individuals. Um, so, so help, help your faculty by opening doors for them. Uh, we try to ease transitions both at the start and at the end of people's careers. So we give new faculty two course releases their first year and one course release their second year. And then faculty, when they're retiring, um, IU has a phased retirement for up to three years where you can work between 50 and 80% of TE time and salary, but you can keep 100% of your fringe benefits. So I think that's something. And then I think you have to give them the resources that they need and want to the extent feasible. Obviously everybody has budgets, but we give each faculty member 4,000 a year in a research account that they control. Um, I have to sign off on things, but it's pretty liberal in terms of you know, what they can spend money on. And unspent money can be carried forward each year. So we're not wanting people to accumulate a war chest, but you know, if you're going to do a sabbatical and you're going to do a lot of traveling, you know, you might save some money each year, but it's enough money to go to a couple conferences every year and have some money for subscriptions and subventions and so on. And so far we've never turned down a sabbatical request. 
And so I think that's another way of enhancing for productivity. I think we have to recognize that the research teaching service trade-offs are real. And so just because someone says yes easily, you know, you don't want to exploit their goodwill. And if someone says no easily, you know, you also have to kind of manage their expectations that, well, you know, we're all in this team together and, and we have to uh, uh, all do some service. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that students still deserve quality instruction and office hours, et cetera. We had some faculty members who didn't want to have office hours, you know, or have one office hour precisely a week. And um, I don't think that flies. Uh, but I think I mentioned earlier, uh, we have our faculty kind of co-determine their teaching schedules as much as possible, which means more meeting time up front. but then I think it leads to higher satisfaction. Um, I also think nobody should be exempted from teaching at the bachelor's degree level. That may work out that they don't, but I don't think they should be exempted from that. And we've had some faculty members teach multiple PhD courses, and I don't think that's a good practice because then the doctoral students you know, go to them for all their advising, uh, the committee work and so on. But it's also just, you know, mentally more draining for, um, uh, for, for the faculty. Okay, so um, any questions on, on that part? Or Will, do you want to add anything on that part? There, there was a question earlier on recruitment. I don't know, on the job market, do you want to answer that later? Um, or yeah, right why now? Why don't we come back to that then? And I did have a question of how those resources might have shifted during COVID, like for research. Were you able to sustain that even over the last year uh, for sabbatical and research? Because I know a lot of institutions are cut, cutting budgets on that stuff. Yeah, so the, the university froze all sabbaticals last year. Um, and so that wasn't our decision. And uh, they actually allowed four sabbaticals to go forward on campus last year. And one of them was one of our faculty members because they were in a very prestigious uh, situation that was able to go forward. Uh, but the two that were not allowed to go forward last year are automatically are going forward next year. And so, uh, you know, so that they'll still get that opportunity. Looks like there's a, sorry. Oh, and I just say on the travel fund, so far we've let people accumulate that this year. We may revisit that, um, but, you know, because people still attended conferences, but they didn't have the travel costs. So. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Stuart. Do you see? Let's see. Sounds like we've thought through faculty development as not about budget or cost suppression, but as an investment. How widespread is this concept seems atypical. Well, you know, and, and we have to, you know, I have to acknowledge we, there are budgets, everyone has budget constraints and so on. But I think, you know, I, I really have always believed that, you know, our, our faculty and staff are our most scarce resource. And, um, you know, we invest a lot of time and money in our faculty uh, and, and and faculty may leave, but I think by creating it as a great place to be, there'll be less, much less likely to leave. And I think ultimately that's a, you know, you create a better environment for everybody else and, uh, and then everybody wants to stay. So, you know, I think sometimes you're gonna lose people because of fit or if someone gets a much, you know, extraordinarily better offer and it would, you know, throw your internal pay equity ladders out of alignment if you, you know, did too much for one person it caused morale problems for everybody else. So you may lose people over time, but I think, you know, if you invest in your people, they're going to be more likely to stay. Yeah, I mean, I, the Stuart, just to touch on the back end of your question there, right, which is how widespread, right? So, I mean, I look at most of this stuff and it seems pretty reflective of what we're doing in our programs, but I know that there are a number of places that don't sort of, they're trying to get as much out of their faculty as they can. Um, 
I think it had to do with right with Patrick's reference. There's some variability across all of these programs. You're familiar with this as well, right? Some some are are, are more well have better budgets, have better sort of disposition, stability, perhaps. Um, and some are much more uh, tr troublesome in their orientation. And it seems like there, there is a bit of a mix. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, I necessarily have got a sense of what the field looks like. I, I don't know if anybody's done that in any way. Attitudes of faculty across programs at different kinds of, pro uh, at different kinds of institutions. I think we'd see some pretty significant variability. And in some ways, Patrick and I are, are presenting the, the rosiest picture. I felt that as I was looking at the slides, right? I mean, the, the Bush School has been a pretty good spot. Um, but not everybody's quite like that. And then, and, and, and if, you know, and if, if what Patrick's talking about reflects a, a modest bit of reality, which I'm pretty sure it does, uh, it, uh, it, it also is a pretty good spot to be, you know, to be teaching, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily, I don't, I don't know, is it indicative of everybody? Probably not, but certainly there are plenty of other programs that do things like we do. Um, or in, in many ways, because we see it competitive wise, right? To hold on to folks, they steal them from us too. Okay, I see Stuart has raised his hand, but we do have a comment also. Alice says, I find there are resources across our campus beyond our department and our college. I try to make a practice to know what's out there and connect okay. our faculty to those resources. Yeah, that's um, a good one, right? Because that's a little bit of what I'm gonna reference too when I talk about sort of trying to make friends of as many places as I possibly can to make to demonstrate that, that what we're studying has a lot of relevance for things that are related to who you are. And so you should be also investing in what we're doing um, and contributing and being aware of those. I think that's a really wise, because a lot of times that, because if it's just the three or four, or two, Patrick may reference one or two people that are nonprofit studies, if that's all there is, I think you can pretty quickly be marginalized and making as many friends as you can, both in the department and across campus is a really wise choice. And I found that, for example, we have a really robust civic engagement service learning program and they offer mini grants. So I have a $300 mini grant for every class I teach. And then we go to the international studies office and have opportunities to do international service learning and nonprofit kinds of things. And um, I could never get that from my college. So, yep. Yeah, that's a great example. Stuart, you wanna add your comment? Um, well, um, I think the specific thing I wanted to say has escaped me, but um, just listening to um, the conversation right now, it, it, I, there's a element of innovation or maybe it's entrepreneurship here um, that I, I hope uh, we could appreciate. So um, in terms of faculty people and having a, a place where they're happy, you know, in, in one sense, it sounds like, um, if we know faculty people, that individually they take their <laughs> gratification in their own you know, ways, right? And they create this, the, the area in which they can be comfortable and thrive but it's systematically as a system in an institution, it seems it's rare that someone puts the thought into, well, how can we create the circumstances for people to succeed? Usually <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's like, Mar it's almost Marxist. It's enough for everybody and the same and make what you will of it. And, um, you know, just understanding how nonprofits work, how usually like Patrick said, there's one or two at each person, uh, at each program, you know, they, if they don't, if they don't form a bond and get along, then not much entrepreneurialism occurs. And mm -hmm. it just sounds like to me that we're talking about one of these fundamental characteristics of the field. Since we, we want people to thrive, we have to create opportunities for them to thrive. And I don't, I, I don't know, that's a little bit of stream of conscious thought, but, um, wondering if you agree with that or if that's just, you know, not true. Yeah, you know, I think Stuart, one of the things we've tried to do is, um, you know, a couple of years ago we were doing a search and we had a fact member, uh, we had an incredible CV um, and uh, who was one of the semi-finalists. And uh, I, you know, just based on, purely on his CV, I was kind of 
suggesting we should consider him as one, one of the finalists and to bring him back for a second look. And one of our junior faculty members said, you know, you guys have done such a great job of creating such a wonderful place to be at. And one person can upset that apple cart by their behavior and attitude. And she said, you know, this guy really didn't listen to our questions. He just gave answers that he wanted to give. He didn't interact. He just lectured back at us, you know, in small group meetings and stuff. And she said, you know, I think he could really destroy the fiber of what our school is. And so in spite of the CV, you know, we did not invite him back for, you know, a final visit. And so I think, you know, paying attention to some of those cues in the hiring process is important. One, somebody asked in the chat about um, adjuncts and full-time faculty. You know, I'll have to say, you know, we're in a situation where um, our median size class is only like 10 or 11, depending on the semester. Now, we cap out at 30, and some of the online classes go up to 30, um, but our classes are relatively small, and our faculty is relatively large, and so we haven't used very many adjuncts. Um, in fact, the campus has kind of said, you guys should use more adjuncts. You, you, you know, you'd save some money and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, I have to sign our full-time faculty first before I go looking for adjuncts. So we're using more adjuncts this year and next year because of sabbaticals and retirements and stuff like that. But um, I do think you want to try to incorporate affiliate faculty members who are full-time faculty members in other schools who are interested in philanthropy um, and adjunct. You know, invite them to your meetings, give them faculty mentors, um, invite them to lectures and social events. Um, and invite them to serve on faculty governance committees um, as their time and interest permit. So I think that's, um, you know, it's harder with an adjunct who only teaches once, but we have some, you know, we have a few adjuncts who teach a class for us every year or a class for us um, every other year, but they're on a regular rotation. And, uh, you know, we try to uh, be intentional about recruiting them and, and uh, treating them well. And we bump up their salary each time they teach for us also with a, with a cap, but if we have them back, we, we bump, bump up the salary. And Will, I think this was a slide that you wanted to talk about. I was gonna chime in on the adjuncts too, just because we do use them online. I mean, that tends to be where we, because we've got the, the online certificate, graduate certificate, and we tend to use the online faculty there fairly consistently. They're a, they're a big piece of what that is. It's probably another five to six individuals, but we try to do it like Patrick says, just to fairly consistently. And it's surprising to me how long they stay. I've had adjuncts that have been there practically the whole time that we've had the certificate program. Um, and then we systematically incorporate just a couple of more folks. And then now as we're moving into continuing education, we're seeing another group of individuals that we're starting to try and be able to connect. Um, in person, we don't actually have that. Part of it's our logistics, right? Um, so we don't have a ton necessarily. If they are, they're affiliated. They're from other places across campus typically that are um, sort of kind of here for us. Yeah, this is, this, is my, this is my slide. This is my set of stuff that I put together. Um, and it, referencing this idea of, of trying to help people both create a sense of culture amongst our subgroups. So we're in a, uh, so we're at the Bush School, we have two departments, uh, international affairs, um, public administration, and then we're within, basically within the public administration program, an area of study. Um, and part of what I felt like I've tried to do over my time here has been to both uh, systematize the, 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 the focus area, so institutionalizing the curriculum, um, and the way that the, the the department thinks about the nonprofit curriculum as, as, as parallel to some of the other components that we have, Homeland Security or, or, or budgeting and finance, um, as well as trying to, as I say, try to make, his, so, to make it feel like that this is a key piece. 
fundamentally the school was formed on this idea, right? So it's a master's of public service administration with a recognition that it's not just public administration, but it's actually this idea of public service, which was an attempt to be aware of the, the nonprofit space and the, the third sector space is a key component. So I've always used that to make the case about who we are. And then what, the other piece that I've done is I've found that there are a number of sort of professors of practice that kind of come in that sometimes end up being left alone a little bit. Um, and I kind of round them up as a way to be able to add to the number of people that, that, that feels like we have. Uh, that are a part of who, be, because they like our stuff, especially once they start to understand it. Um, we have some need, need around some of our core courses to be taught. And so they actually get in and they're like, oh, this is really interesting. I think of a couple of professors of practice that I've been able to more or less co-opt and become part of our faculty because they weren't necessarily here exclusively to do nonprofit stuff, but they were close enough that we could sort of loop them in and they were looking for a home. So we had this kind of place that there was a, a sense of who we were. Um, and then the other thing we've tried to do is both differentiate core, fat, core courses. So we know we've got a nice track of courses that are good for tenured and tenure track faculty and our, our, our professor of practice that we have that's alloc allocated for us. But then we've also tried to make sure that people who are somewhat related to us see that there's some interesting things to potentially be added. It, it's only modestly successful. But increasingly, Patrick made reference to there's a number of topics right around social justice and, and, and uh, civil society. And, and we're seeing that as opportunities to make some more friends across campus. It's an area where we want to try and do a little bit better job at. Um, I think I touched on the last one as well. So it's this bit between trying to create a real cultural space and making sure that the college sees it as a valuable component to who we are is kind of what I've been a part of. Well, there's a question that came in in the chat from Charlie Cummings. Uh, have you ever recruited an adjunct to teach a new course in your program? If so, how do you support them with course design and curriculum development? How much is hands-on versus letting them run with it? Yeah, we, we, we have, um, particular when we know somebody. So if we know the individual, I guess, so they, they, they almost, it's almost a negotiated component, right? Where somebody comes up and says, uh, I have this idea or I'm thinking about it, or we know them and we'll talk to them about, would you have any interest in being able to create this course? So we just got a new course and adjuncts built it around advocacy and, and it was both him kind of coming to us saying, what about an advocacy course? And, and us saying, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I worked directly with that individual on the, in the creation of the syllabus. And we've been, been more systematic in making sure that some of that stuff passes through a committee. So we actually all took a look at it, but it's been me and the department head plus the committee looking at his syllabus to kind of get it helped up, fixed up. If it's, an online course and it's an adjunct, they actually are very structured. They have the prescript pre about what a syllabus is supposed to look like, how you're supposed to structure, what the learning objectives are, because a lot of that stuff's pre-recorded. So an adjunct is going to follow a pretty rigorous, and that's done by a staff member over there that facilitates the online uh, structure of the course. In person, it's, it, there is some variability. So the example I just gave you was a bit more of a structured one. We've also had people get dropped into stuff. It's not always ideal though, um, in, in person. Um, online, we never would drop somebody in. It's fully structured, it's fully built beforehand and it's been reviewed by a number of individuals. I just say one thing that we, because of COVID, the campus created a winter term that we didn't used to have and it was either um, a three-week session uh, or a six-week session and um, and all of our faculty members are already at load and so um, we recruited as an experiment um, for adjuncts to teach um, one credit hour classes over the winter term and um, and I'd say you know we gave them you know kind of creative license to design the classes um, they're all electives and so on, and they're all online, but we also provided a lot of um, our program directors, worked with them on syllabi design and 
assessment tools and you know, you know, grade expectations and so on. And then we had a staff member who's really good in Canvas, the, the, the online platform, and he worked with them to you know, navigate through Canvas and stuff like that. So I think you want to provide enough support so that they don't feel like they're drowning, but enough discretion that they feel like they, you know, kind of own the class uh, as as well. Okay, let's see. So um, speaking of COVID, but so what are the unique challenges of managing faculty during the COVID pandemic? And, um, you know, I think one of the things that's really important to recognize is, you know, COVID hit households somewhat randomly and unevenly. Um, and while many of us were able to remain healthy and work remotely, um, some got sick and other people died and had, or had to care for others who got sick. And one of the things that, you know, and the, there's clearly among the our faculty who have talked to me about this, at least there was a gender effect that some of our female fact members uh, had to suddenly homeschool their kids and learn about e-learning from the perspective of young students. And so, you know, they they said, you know, look, I can't be in meetings during some of these times because my kids are e-learning then. Um, and you know, we just had to work with them on that, recognizing that it was uh, kind of a unique set of circumstances. Um, you know, some people, I think, really actually blossomed on, on Zoom. I mean, I think it was a, uh, allowed for them to be more engaged than they are in a large meeting uh, normally. And others talked about Zoom fatigue and could they just do a conference call or uh, just do email because they just you know felt like they're wilting on the vine. So again, you have to kind of recognize that everybody's different, and um, and not everybody can do Zoom meetings all day every day and, and be happy. Um, and other people, you know, really like that type of you know more direct interaction. Um, you know, the isolation, the physical isolation, created personal and public health for everybody. But I think it caused depression and, and loneliness and loneliness and uh, and other mental health challenges for some people who, you know, might be more extroverted. And um, you know, some of our faculty members are literally home alone, and I think that was hard hard for them. And then I, I'll I'll say, you know, online teaching includes some of the worst aspects of teaching grading. And uh, none of the best aspects of teaching, which, you know, in terms of that interaction and, and seeing an idea develop and, you know, watching the learning actually occur, that doesn't happen in online instruction typically. And so that makes online instruction more challenging. And, and, and granted, we all had to pivot to teach online for uh, because of COVID, but uh, some of us are teaching largely online already. Those kinds of yeah, we saw we saw all that. Uh, there was that earlier question Alicia had posted about sort of forecasts for the March job market in regard to COVID. Any thoughts there? Any thoughts on it? Say it again. Oh, uh, the job market related to post COVID and whether it whether the yeah how COVID might have impacted or what, the future of the of the field in regards to growth, decline, I don't know. Yeah, uh, you know, I feel badly for graduate students who are coming out. You know, we had a hard freeze this last year. Um, and, you know, our chancellor just said yesterday at the faculty council meeting that, you know, they're going to, uh, they expect that that will start loosening up in the fall, but um, it's, it, you know, there were, no bonuses, no raises, no supplemental pay at all for a year. No, um, even hiring adjuncts, even hiring graduate students uh, was impossible, difficult if not impossible. And so uh, we're hopeful that it'll get better. But I think that that kind of a labor market, if, if, if that's what Indiana University is doing university-wide and lots of other places are doing it, then it's a, it's a tough market to go on to. And hopefully there'll be some pent up demand and 
the good thing about being a graduate student is if you can stay where you're at, you can, you know, you know, you can work on your research publications and maybe teach a class and, and embellish your, uh, enhance your CV in some ways that might help you be more competitive, you know, the following year, but it's tough. Okay. Um, other questions? Any great? Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts? There's a there's been a good discussion between Alice and I think Aaron. I don't know if you wanted to add in any other comments verbally going on the chat. Well, I would just say that one of the things I this I just finished my 33rd year at Slippery Rock and I laughed because I've graded 66, I've turned in 66 semesters of grades, right? And so one of the things that, um, I came here in PA, but have now been teaching public administration, I mean, nonprofit management for a long time. And one of the things a mentor told me was, always keep one foot outside of the department. Hmm. And that was amazing advice. And one of those feet was with the administration. So the more I understood how my work could make their job easier and I could educate them about the value of what we do, um, it's, I, we've, been, we've really been pretty able to create a culture here so that from the president, no matter who it is on down, kind of knows what we do to help get their tenure insured, right? And so I think that's that creating that culture has been really important. And the other thing most recently, we only have, we have an undergraduate major here, but um, the other thing that is, is that we've really tried to capitalize on the idea of the Gen Z where they want to do something in life that makes a difference. And they want to, they want to have um, a work life of value, right? And um, they also are looking for lots of credentials. And so this idea of credential stacking a little bit, we've, I've worked really closely with departments all across the campus to create 15 credit certificates for our undergraduates. And three of the classes are in our major, but two of the classes are in another program. Right. So we have writing for the nonprofit sector as a certificate. So we'll have a couple, we'll have students that take two of the professional writing courses and then say, oh my goodness, I only have to take three of the nonprofit and then I'll have that certificate also. So we have now six of those certificates across the campus and are working probably by this time next year, I think we'll have 12. And so that recruits students to us that we wouldn't otherwise have maybe, and it also recruits students to those other departments that they might not otherwise have. So in terms of um, advising, many of the people in English will say, hey, why don't you take this? Because now you can get that certificate. And that's been really good for our numbers. We have about 60 undergraduates in our program. And um, it's, been, it's been really good because faculty across campus know us yeah. and send students to us. So, I mean, we only have, you know, a shortly under 9,000 students. So it's kind of easy to know everybody at some level, but that's been very, very useful. Now, those are great strategies uh, for, for building your footprint uh, across campus and, and, and the value, absolutely. I do have a question though, because <clears throat> We've just been told that next year, um, we're gonna be authorized to do a search for two full-time tenure track positions in our nonprofit management program. And one of the problems is there are not too many PhD programs that channel mm -hmm. people right to us. And I know that there are public administration programs. I went through one, but that heavy focus on government really doesn't help me in this department the way I needed to. And I'm wondering where might I start to look? Well, we have several students who will be going on the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting 
I think, I mean, like I made reference to the sociology students, right? So I just, I know that there's, for me, there's an increasing number of folks that seem to be seeing us as an outlet. Um, I mean, I think, yes, the, the, for us, the core continue to come from public administration, um, but there are a variety of other individuals that it's not quite clear. I mean, I, I, I was talking with the folks who were doing the search in, 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 um, in an institution, they weren't clear what their prospects were going to be. And it actually ended up being much more robust than they had anticipated. So I don't think we fully know what the nature of the market is, but I think I'm hope, I hopeful, I'm hopeful for you that, that you'll actually find a, a pretty decent group of individuals. Uh, what are you thinking, Renee? Um, I, I think the, the, the widest net, since, since you're connected with public administration, Alice, the widest net is, is gonna be those um, public policy, public admin students. Um, but the thing is you'll get, you'll get 400 applications and about 40 of them, seriously, about 10% will be truly um, nonprofit specialists. Yeah. They'll, they'll be good. And that, that's, those are the ratios we were seeing right. five years ago. Um, so, I mean, that's still 40 good candidates to sort through. It's just that the initial sort through is it'll, it'll be quick. It's like <laughs> no nonprofit expertise. <laughs> They're gone. So, yeah, so um, what would you write in the job description? Uh, because, you know, I mean, I could see that there could be, I, I would really like to have somebody more that has a community development background than has a public administration background, but some kind of a balance, right? Um, we have a, an institute for nonprofit leadership here and we're working with nonprofits in about a hundred mile radius and really starting to take a deep dive in there. And, and certainly the the position's description is going to be someone who has had experience with developing and managing um, an outreach kind of effort. Right. Um, one will probably be, my guess, maybe at the associate level and one at assistant level. So these are, and these are tenure tracks. So these are really pretty good jobs. Um, where would I advertise? So you can advertise in social work, um, planning, planning PhD programs policy for public admin, of course. So those, uh, and, and even some colleges of ed will have a strong community development focus mm -hmm. just to be, you know, I tend to think of the, the public admin um, environment would be the strongest. However, those others really do have, but still, you're still looking for someone with really substantial nonprofit chops. Yep. You, you can't just say, you know, I, I have this much community development work without, in order to be a tenure track faculty member within the, the nonprofit structure, you really have to have uh, some academic exposure to, to the wide breadth of scholarship that, that, that's finally out there, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, you may, it, that may, you know, really wanting someone with, with, excellent community development experience may narrow it down to 10 people, but still it's a 10. So yes. it's good. You'll, you'll be fine. So those, those planning, um, what was the other one? Social work. Mm -hmm. education. Yeah. And we're also putting in the ad that it needs to be somebody that has some significant practitioner experience right. or consulting experience and not, and, oh as well as scholarship and academics. So, yeah, so it's that, really that, hard to find that academician who is a good scholar also, you know? Yeah, that's a, that, that add, that, that, I would say that additional layer is actually gonna be, a, will, will add a tremendous amount. Because of, you can have a lot of pressure crafts. Right. You just don't connect with what's going on on the ground. I put the language we used, Alice, in the, in the most recent, you know, so it, 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 it was an attempt to try and be broad um, but also narrow it down a little bit. So we didn't perfect. say PA, but that was the language we had used that we settled in. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it, it was, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't emphasize any particular discipline per se. Um, and I and just put the list. We're going to be positioning ourselves also. And um, we've gotten the green light from the state system to develop um curriculum for a master's program. So again, somebody who can help us in that area. So, yep, thank you. 
And I just put the list, the link, so you can see the PhD programs with the nonprofit focus where these junior faculty might be coming from. But I would also advise Arnova, listserv, right? And NAC, we advertise positions too. So you'll get that nonprofit person. So we have a few minutes left. Any other questions or comments? R Renee, is that your head? I, I really shouldn't say this is because this is goes against what you were doing in the webinars, presenting solutions to us. And I really appreciate that. Sorry for looking over here when I should be looking at the camera. Camera, okay. Um, the situation I've been up against for the last uh, 20 years here is building the nonprofit program um, in a multi topic department. So we have two other master's degrees um, beyond the m and One of them is an MPA, which we're closely allied with. And uh, the other one is a planning master's degree. So um, here's the pattern and it repeats every single year. Um, students flood the nonprofit courses. We get overwhelmed. We ask for more support. And, and we have been able to slowly build our faculty from one to three, three nonprofit full tenure track faculty members. Um, meanwhile, the numbers of students has just exploded in terms of nonprofit, you know, master students and certificate students and undergraduate minor students. So we're, we've got a lot on our hands. On the planning side, however, their enrollment has been flat, flat, flat for 20 years. And, and their number of faculty members has grown from five to eight. So, um, and so they, their mindset is if we add this faculty member in this new planning field, that will attract more students and they'll come and we'll grow the program, right? So it's, if it, for them, it's a, if you build it, they will come model. For us, however, it's if we build it, um, we build it, oh, you know, what's the solution? And the solution keeps coming back to me as, oh, well, have you ever thought about having a professor of practice? So in other words, an exalted um, adjunct faculty member to be our fourth faculty member. So there's, a, I just wanna voice my frustration. I think a lot of people in our field deal with this point of view from administration. Uh, so it's, um, it's an annual struggle. <laughs> I keep, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, take take the professor of practice. I mean, right? I mean, that's that's what we did, right? I mean, you, it, they added they add a nice blend. It, it touches on what Alice was talking about. You can specifically focus in on that applied practitioner. You can actually it mitigates the scholarship demand. So there's actually, a, and and sometimes they can increase. They have an increased teaching load. Sometimes they're whatever one or more or two more than 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 a, than a research professor um, might have. And so. I found them to be a nice addition to. to I just, stuff. I just see it as a double standard. That's mm -hmm. not right, considering that, that we've always grown, and we're bigger than. Yeah, honestly, we're we're larger than the other program, and and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah. I have a question about um, the post-COVID market. I'm wondering, uh, you know, as I watch friends in other sectors like the private sector. Um, you know, someone I know was supposed to move to Seattle to work for Zillow. And of course, during COVID, they got, uh, you know, they're working remotely and they've now been told you're going to work remotely forever. So are there opportunities? Like I know universities, we, we are very brick and mortar focused, but, you know, I'm thinking, wow, you know, could we cross fertilize some of our programs with people from around the country? Is that reaching too far as faculty? I mean, like you maybe don't have to pick up and move to Slippery Rock, you know, would you, could, is there a way that, that we learn from um, this COVID experience of more people working remotely? Just a question to you out there. I think Personally, I think there's going to be more openness to that as a possibility. You know, however, I mean, what we saw enrollment wise was that fortuitously, we started an entirely online master's degree a couple of years before COVID. And, and those enrollments 
you know, just went through the roof, right, during the last year. Um, and, but our undergraduate freshman and sophomore enrollments went down. Yeah. yeah. And, and there was also more complaining from them than the graduate students. And so um, even non-campus graduate students, you know, pivoted pretty well. Um, so, you know, I think part of what you want from a faculty member is being there to be with students, right? So unless you're doing something that's entirely online, on the other hand, you know, if you have a, you know, kind of like a cohort of faculty who are there and available to do things with students face-to-face, -face, you can have a onesie or a twosie who are working remotely and, and do that successfully, I think. Um, I think there's going to be more tolerance for that. Um, uh, we had a faculty member who was retiring this summer and, you know, she moved to Colorado this year. Now, it worked out propitiously because nobody would, would have noticed anyways, right? Um, right. She made those plans pre-COVID. Um, and we, in the econ department, we've got somebody who just said, I'm going to work from Florida, tired of cold. And, uh, you know, and he was able to work it out. But, you know, our campus, our chancellor wants to have the campus be lively and vibrant and stuff in the fall. Uh, but again, I think, you know, there may be opportunities for cross fertilization and people working remotely. Um, but you you know you do miss that you know you're not going to be there for the you know informal lunches and the face to face uh, hallway conversations and things like that. So you know I think it's a, a balancing that people will have to take. And I agree, undergrad world completely different. Um, graduate level depends. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, well, I the, the, get the slide back up. We'll see uh, the next month's webinar. But first of all, thank you to our presenters today. Amazing. And thank you for all you participants and attendees. Thank you. Uh, we have, we'll be talking about student recruitment and retention and support, which I'm sure you're all dealing with right now during final exam period, if that's what's happening. So thank you so much for joining us today. And please reach out to myself or Nicole or the presenters if you have any additional follow-up questions. Uh, we're happy to answer anything and um, we hope you join us next month. Thank you. Thank you.